He's Greg. I'm Nick. This episode is brought to you by FanDuel, the exclusive wagering part of the CLNS Media Network. New customers join today, and you'll get $200 in bonus bets if your first bet of $5 or more wins. Greg, let's start with the uh, news of the day. And, of course, I'm talking about Ben McAdoo. Uh, it is official. He will be an offensive assistant, assistant head coach, whatever the title is. He'll be working with Alex Van Pelt on that side of the football. Your thoughts? Uh, so, yeah, I mean, look, it's interesting. I think um, what should be stated up top is that uh, I know, and, and we'll talk about this as this goes on, um, this is a, uh, you know, a Packers-centric hire on the face of it. Um, he worked with Alex Van Pelt with the Packers. They worked with Elliot Wolf, who was the assistant GM there before uh, going with John Dorsey to Cleveland. Uh, it should also be noted that uh, that McAdoo, Wolf's not the only guy that McAdoo has worked with in the building. And <clears throat> I know there's been some talk about how, like, Wolf's the only guy who has any experience outside the building. That's not, in fact, correct. Uh, Patrick Stewart, who came back, he was let go as Panthers VP of personnel, um, I think, uh, before last season. He came back in any event. And he had, yes, he came up with the Patriots, but he also, he went to the Eagles. He went uh, to the Panthers. So it, Patrick Stewart has very similar um, experience as Elliot Wolf. So um, people shouldn't make the mistake by saying like, this is just Elliot Wolf and this is his fingerprints. Now, just on Ben McAdoo, and this could be the case for uh, a lot of people that come work here. Um, Ben McAdoo is a guy I covered with the Packers. I think at the time, I think he was the tight ends coach. And it was before, you know, he went on to become, you know, an offensive coordinator and the Giants head coach and all that stuff. Um, I think a lot of Ben, I know there's a lot of outside perception about him, his press conference with the Giants, his appearance, like things like that. Um, I, I've always thought very highly of Ben. I think he's very good at what he does. He's extremely organized. He knows offense very well. He knows quarterbacks very well. Um, I think that, and I put this out on Twitter, um, and of course it generated a lot of discussion. I just, I just love how I hear from these people on Twitter who have something to say about <laughs> everything. Um, but men, Ben McAdoo checking in with people who have worked with him and work closely with him. Um, He's he's known as a extremely good evaluator of talent at the quarterback position and the offense overall. Um, you know, for example, a few examples. He he wanted he pounded he basically stood on the table for the Giants to trade up for Patrick Mahomes um, when the Chiefs eventually did it um, in the 2018 draft when he wasn't working. Um, he told the New York Post that. His draft evaluations, now they weren't perfect, and none of our draft evaluations are ever perfect. He ranked Josh Allen and Lamar Jackson 1-2 in that draft. Now, he had Baker Mayfield way down on the bottom. Um, you know, in some ways, he wasn't wrong about that. Um, you know, but there was also, you know, he helped Eli Manning um, come from, like, I think he threw 27 interceptions the year before he got there. He improved after. He sort of saw the writing on the wall that Eli Manning was done and wanted to move on from him. Saw some things from Geno Smith, who he wasn't – maybe it didn't work out for the Giants, but we saw how he at least did last year with the Seahawks. So um, Ben McAdoo has a very good reputation for offensive talent evaluation, and I think we all know that ain't nothing wrong with that with where the Patriots are right now. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm so glad that you brought up some of those things. Uh, I actually just finished my own live podcast this morning, uh, the Nick Cattle Show, and I talked a lot about Ben. And I remember when I was doing Radio Greg, all the jokes, right? Ben Macadont and the slick back hair and the bowl cut and the the workout suit, whatever the hell he would wear, and <laughs> along with the sunglasses. He became a caricature. But you have to go beyond the caricature. You've got to go beyond the perception. And what Greg just shared, he's right. I just want to add a couple of things to what he just said. In 2018, uh, he was talking about Sam Darnold. 
said he's obviously a talented guy. He can make plays with his feet. I just have a hard time drafting a guy in the first round where you don't necessarily like the way he throws. He said, can he overcome it? Yes, but he looks at it as a fundamental flaw, and he believes in fundamentals. To put a little bit of extra sugar on the Mahomes stuff, New York Post wrote this about the 2017 draft. McAdoo became smitten with Mahomes, telling Giants management outright that, uh, quote, I would love to get my bleeping hands on Mahomes, unquote. So <clears throat> when you look at the history, he, he has shown the ability to evaluate the quarterback position. And to add a little extra to Greg's point about Eli Manning, Manning did throw 26, 27 picks in 2013. And then in 2014 and 2015, with McAdoo as the OC, he threw 65 touchdowns and 28 total picks. So from 27 interceptions in 2013 alone to 28 interceptions combined in the two years that Ben was the OC. And looking at it, Greg, when, when Ben McAdoo has been asked to have one role, to design plays, to work with the offense, to call plays, he's actually been pretty damn good. In 2014 with the Giants, they were 10th in yards. They were 13th in scoring. In 2015, he backed that up, made them even better. They were 8th in yards, 6th in scoring. They were a top 10 offense in 2015 with an Eli Manning who was teetering on being absolutely freaking washed. So I do think you look at that, and if people say, oh, well, it's five, six years ago, in 2022 with the Panthers, let's not forget, Matt Rule was fired. It was a chaotic year. McCaffrey was traded. And in the second half of 2022, the offense was top 10 in yards per play and top 10 in EPA. So if you like those analytics, he was also pretty good with that. And if you like analytics, in 2014-15 as the play caller for the Giants, they were 12th combined in those years in EPA. So again, when he's been an OC and he has had one focus, we've said it a lot, how many coordinators do you have that end up being terrible head coaches? He wasn't a good head coach, obviously. But when you look at when he's been focused on that one side of the ball and an OC, he's done it for three years with those circumstances. And the history tells us, Greg, he's been actually pretty damn good at it. Yeah, and what I'll also point out about that um, Panthers season in 2022, <clears throat> they had three distinctly different quarterbacks play games. And, you know, Baker Mayfield, he was one and five. Sam Darnold was four and two. And PJ Walker was two and three. And they basically had to run different schemes with all three of them. And so, you know, I think that's actually pretty good work. I mean, that, that team went from, I think they were one and four under uh matt rule and then they finished seven and ten um under steve wilkes so they played winning football after um matt rule left the building and so i think look i think that i've always been impressed with uh, with ben i think that um i think he he's extremely smart I think his communication's pretty good i think you know when i covered him with the packers and the tight ends i think about like um you know, Jermichael Finley comes to mind. Um, there was a big blocking Donald Lee. Like I always thought his, his, his guys were good. And, um, you know, I would say sometimes he was a little, I don't know. I think you could say he was a little bit too media friendly at some points in time, a little too ambitious. And it's funny because, <clears throat> you know, off of those guys that I covered with the Packers around the time where, uh, Brett Favre went to the MC championship game, the beginning of Aaron Rodgers. Like there were two guys on that staff who, who, who got, who became head coaches quickly, McAdoo and Joe Philbin. And both of them probably would have been one of the last, uh, assistants that I would have picked to be head coaches <laughs> on that staff. Um, and I was surprised when they rose that quickly. Uh, you know, I think that Ben over the years has been, ambitious there's nothing wrong with that but I think he's learned a lot of lessons and I think he's a lot more wise now but I, I think um look we could say this I mean Alex Van Pelt and Ben McAdoo see things through the same lens and and I think that McAdoo can help Gerard Mayo a little bit I, I think that gets a little bit overblown um yes he has experience as a head coach to me, I just think that Ben can do a lot of things. I think the Patriots need people who could do a lot of things. And um, to me, 
this solidifies that the Patriots are the Patriots are going to be a West Coast offense. Um, you can talk yeah. about Stefanski all you want, but these guys came up together with the Packers under Mike McCarthy, and uh, it'll be it, it'll just be interesting to see how they've evolved and the sort of new tricks they may have they may have learned to apply because I think. McCarthy's one of these guys who hasn't really evolved. Maybe these guys being in different places with different people can elevate the West Coast offense, not to the not to the level that Kyle Shanahan did, because the Shanahan McVay offense is a West Coast offense at its base. But those guys took it to a different level. Um, if those guys can find a, a medium ground, I think it's a good thing for the Patriots. And also, let's not forget when we look back at the Ben McAdoo years in New York when he was the head coach. Pretty difficult situation because, number one, as you mentioned, Greg, the Eli Manning dilemma. And that's really the undoing of Ben McAdoo. He wanted to bench Eli. He thought Eli was done. New York, John Mara, fans, you know, they they still love the idea of Eli. That's where it kind of fractured. But when you look at I mean, he was – when he was brought in as the head coach when he was promoted, 38 years old. He's, he's 37, 38 years old. And he's dealing with a quarterback who at the time is also in his late 30s. <laughs> so not the easiest set of circumstances. And also the roster. Look, I know not a lot of people are going to look back at the Giants roster because they don't have the time. They've got lives to live. I have no life. I have no job right now. So I looked back. And that roster that he had with the Giants, if you think this roster is bad with the Patriots right now, feast your eyes on the 2017 Giants. And yes, Odell Beckham was part of that team. He played four games in 2017. I guarantee you there's not more than two receivers on that roster that you will remember. And running back, we're talking Arlene's Darkwa and Wayne Gallman. And the offensive line was a disaster. So uh, it's not like he was given a bunch of groceries to the point where if you look at what happened when McAdoo left, which nobody will talk about. McAdoo was gone. He wanted to get rid of Eli. The Giants grasped tightly to Eli's legend. And in 2019, the Giants went 5-11. and 11. So, uh, actually, no, Eli was done by 2019. Sorry, the Giants went 5-11 and 11, 11 in 2018 after McAdoo left. So, that was really, that was Eli's last year as a starter, was 2018. They went 5-11. and 11. So, I think McAdoo was proven right. When you look in hindsight, the team stunk. The roster stunk. It was aging. They didn't have a lot of weapons. Eli was, again, teetering on being washed and then got there. And they went 5-11 and 11 after McAdoo left. So it's not as if he left and they solved all the problems. No. No, he, he was actually part of the beginning of the problem with that roster. All right, let's go to uh, Jerry Montgomery. Another hiring made. Defensive line coach now, Greg, for the Patriots. He obviously replaces Demarcus Covington, who's promoted to D.C. Montgomery, you guessed it, also from Green Bay. Yeah, he was a guy I, I have not covered, um, but the people there uh, speak very, very highly of him. Um, Mike Daniels, uh, the former defensive tackle, um, who undersized defensive tackle, rose to prom prominence with the Packers, and then his – I think because of injuries, his career got short-circuited. I remember I did a um, – he was part of a series of cover stories that I did for SI back in the day about sort of like um, uh, the next great sort of uh, line players on both sides of the line. And uh, I remember talking to Jerry back then and also Mike. And Mike can't say enough good things about Jerry Montgomery. And I think, uh, you know, you look at uh, – they have Kenny Clark – there with yeah. the Packers. Um, he, Jerry Montgomery had served under three different defensive coordinators for the Packers. So that just tells you what the building thought of him as a positional coach. Now, Halfley comes in now. He's bringing in his own guy as defensive line coach, um, which is, is certainly his, he's allowed to do that. And I don't think it's an indictment on Montgomery or anything like that. I think they're just, they're, they're going to a different style of defense, but, um, I think he's a, I think he's a really good coach. I think he'll uh, he'll fit in well and he'll do well with the Patriots. Kind of a Packer Patriots feel to this staff with Elliot Wolf, Van Pelt, McAdoo, Montgomery. Uh, who else do you think could be on their way, Greg? If you had a guess, 
Okay. So, um, well, Rick Saratella, who's doing draft work for us at BSJ, he said that um, at the Senior Bowl, what he heard was that um, that Wolf could seek to bring in well-respected executive Alonzo Highsmith, whom he worked with closely in Green Bay, to help hmm. oversee the personnel decision-making process. Um, I've heard a little bit of that. Um, I will say that under when, when I covered the Packers, um, under Ted Thompson – Basically, like Elliot Wolf and Alonzo Highsmith sort of rose together on def- on, on different sides of the ball. Elliot was more pro personnel, I want to say, and Alonzo with more college. But they basically rose together to be overarching, like right under Ted Thompson. Um, they were basically Ted's go-to guys to, um, you know, in terms of negotiating with free agents, trying to craft trades, stuff like that. Um so they've basically joined at the hip. So that that would not surprise me. Um, you know, I think that John Dorsey, who was in many ways, Elliot Wolf was sort of his protege. Uh, he, John Dorsey was, uh, you know, he went to become the Chiefs GM. That's when Elliot and Alonzo rose up. Uh, when Dorsey went to Cleveland after Kansas City, he brought Elliot Wolf. And Alonzo, I think, with him uh, to be under him. So Elliot's sort of his protege. He's right now a senior executive with the Lions. He's been there for a couple of years. I, you know, it, Dorsey's one of these guys who doesn't move around a lot, or doesn't want to move around a lot. He's got a he's got a younger family um, for a, for for an older guy, and so I don't know if that would be in the offing, but he. He would be the type of guy, if it's not Alonzo, who's at the University of Miami, helping that program. I could see Elliot Wolf trying to get John Dorsey over here. He's got extensive experience as a general manager, has great uh, contacts throughout the league, is really known for his draft evaluations. So that's possible. On the coaching front, some of the names that stood out to me, uh, James Campen, the offensive line coach, he was just let go by the Panthers, um, you know, a, a really good offensive line coach. The players love him. There's an NFL Films uh, little snippet that features Aaron Rodgers. If you want to search for that, it sort of tells you about it. He's extremely high character. One of the best people I've ever been around in the NFL. Uh, he certainly would work with, you know, worked with Van Pelt, work with all these guys. They all know each other. They know the scheme. Similar, Joe Philbin, the former Dolphins coach, he just spent the last season as an analyst at Ohio State. He's from Longmeadow. He's a New England native. If Campen maybe wants to retire or doesn't want to do it anymore, uh, I could see Philbin being offensive line coach or just helping on the offensive side of the ball. Edgar Bennett, uh, the former NFL running back, uh, has coached both wide receivers and running backs, is currently the Raiders wide receivers coach, um, survived yeah. from uh, – Gruden to McDaniels to now Antonio Pierce. I don't know if he plans on staying. What the deal is, they have a new offense. You know, Luke Getzey's coming in. I think they work together in Green Bay. Maybe he stays. Winston Moss, former uh, Packers linebackers coach, has been working in the UFL. I know the Patriots are looking for a linebackers coach. He would seem to fit. Um, and so those are the guys that that stood out. These are all guys that I covered. I think the world of all of them, I think they're excellent coaches uh, I think the Patriots could do a lot worse than get some of these guys that were uh, there in sort of, you know, around 2007 to like 2012 with the Packers. Happy Super Bowl to all who celebrate from FanDuel, America's number one sports book. If you're like me, Super Bowl Sunday is all about scoring the best seat on the couch, grabbing your favorite football snacks and placing some super bets. I love when my wife gets in the kitchen and starts making stuff for Super Bowls. And now that the Patriots aren't there, I actually get to be home and enjoy it with my family, which is nice. So I'm looking forward to it uh, this Super Bowl. Uh, FanDuel has so many ways for you to end the season with a W or two or three. Not only can you bet on who will win Super Bowl 58, but FanDuel also has bets for which players will score a touchdown, how many points will be scored, and so much more. New customers join today and you'll get $200 in bonus bets if your first bet of $5 or more wins. Just visit fanduel.com slash Boston to sign up. That's fanduel.com slash Boston. 
Make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sportsbook partner of the NFL. Speaking of coaching, Greg, uh, two guys that are leaving the program here in New England. Steve Belichick goes to the University of Washington as the new defensive coordinator. Of course, there's a connection there with Jed Fish and the coaching staff. Fish was here in 2020 as the quarterback's coach. Vinny Sinceri also leaving as the running back's coach here in New England. He's going to Washington with Steve, and he's actually going to work with the secondary, which is where he was in college. Uh, just kind of your thoughts about Belichick and Sinceri moving on. Well, Sinceri is uh, is no shock. I, I think he was one of the weaker links on this coaching staff. It's interesting that he's going from covering uh, coaching running backs in the National Football League to coaching safeties, which he played in college at the college level. Yeah. Yep. That that just shows you how sort of effed up Bill's staff was, <laughs> how out of control it had gotten here. Um, you know, I think it's I think it's interesting. We've talked about it all along. Where you know, I told you that from what I heard, uh, the talk about Steve Belichick and maybe Brian Sticks, but uh, that them being retained or they have an offer to stay here, uh, a lot of that was happy talk from what I heard, that it wasn't really reality. I mean, yeah, they're saying that, but is it really just a contract ploy to be like, oh, well, we're not going to, we're not firing you, you know, but if you want to leave and now we don't have to pay you or, or what have you. Uh, I, I just find it interesting that these guys, whether it's Bill O'Brien and we'll have to see what happens with him, um, you know, once the BC job shakes out, I don't have any information on that. But these Patriots guys are going to college. I wonder if Bill, the father, told Steve, like, screw the crafts. You have a year left on your deal. Make sure they pay your deal. Why don't you go to college? Because that doesn't count towards your NFL contract so you can double up for a year and when I get a job a year from now you can come back to the National Football League so I I don't know the whole thing's interesting it would make sense if uh Bill was giving the sons that advice it, it would make sense that Bill would, would say that to them especially now that it seems like uh I don't know. I don't. Wanna, I don't want to overblow things, but there definitely seems to be a little bit of uh, pettiness and a little bit of back and forth between the two sides, the Crafts and the Belichicks and the people that were on Belichick's staff. And I think when you look at it, people want a turnover on this staff, and they're getting it. The offensive staff is going to be, I think, pretty much all new. When you look at you know the defensive staff, Steve's gone. Brian could be gone. So there's some major changes there. Obviously, Steve was the play caller for the last few years. And I think Steve did a really good job at what, what he was asked to do, by the way. And I do think it's a loss for the Patriots coaching staff to lose Steve. But there was just a lot of weirdness. So you got to move on. And, and when you look at the guys that have been in, in Belichick's trusted circle, I just find it hilarious where it's like a couple of weeks ago, oh, Belichick, if he if he gets a job, he's going to put the dream team together. <laughs> Like, what the, what's the dream team? Like, uh, Matt Patricia, from what I know, unemployed. Joe Judge, from what I know, unemployed. Um, who would be the offensive lines coach? Skarnecki is not coming out of retirement to go down to Atlanta or anywhere else. So who's your O-line coach? Josh McDaniels, I get. You know, Josh McDaniels, good offensive coordinator. So that's fine. But this dream team of a coaching staff. So really? Patricia, Judge, and and, and who else? I guess maybe his son Steve now. So I think that tells know, you the value I don't know about a of the dream coaches. team, but Bill, I don't know about a dream team, but Bill was definitely going to put, if he got a job, he was definitely going to put his people back. I mean, it's not like, Oh, no doubt. Go, no doubt. He was going to bring his people back. My, my, my issue is calling it a dream team. And, and I saw, and I saw the report calling him a dream team. And I'm like, that's a dream team. It's a team. I, I don't, I don't know if I put dream in front of it. All right, so with all that said, Greg, we look on the offensive side especially, right? Because I don't think many people have an issue with DeMarcus Covington. And Jeremy, we said this earlier, Jeremy Springer, we said this last week. Come on now. We have no idea what that guy's going to do with special teams. Right. And special teams isn't that important. The biggest issue was Belichick having six or seven roster spots to the coverage team in 2023 and moving up in the fourth round to draft a kicker who ended up stinking this year. So yeah, he's going he's gonna, to he's gonna unlock Ryland. <laughs> Let's let's look at the uh, offensive offensive staff. Overall, thirty thousand feet. Do you like the direction? Good question. Do I like the direction? 
Um, I don't dislike it. Um, do I love it? Uh, probably not. But I, yeah, I like it. I mean, look, it checks a lot of boxes, and we and we talked about this a little bit with Van Pelt that, um, you know. I like how they're bringing in an experienced group and you might not like the scheme and you might want Shanahan and McVay, but it's not that like these guys are dodos. Like they know how to move the ball. They know how to score, score points. Um, it's not the most creative scheme, but these guys have been through it. They've been with a bunch of different teams. They've been a, with a bunch of different quarterbacks and head coaches. And I think that given where Gerard Mayo is and he basically has like no experience and he's not really prepared for this role. And, you know, and he's going to lean more towards defense, like trying to get as, as many experienced guys and coaches. I mean, I would love to see them keep going with, you know, like I said, like James camping on the offensive line, um, you know, find, find a, a really good wide receivers coach, whether that's, you know, Edgar Bennett or what have you um, keep going back to these guys that they have experience with, that they know that they work well with. And the Patriots to me are going to have a baseline offensively. And it's going to be like, it's not going to be top, but you know, it's going to be baseline is going to be like middle of the pack. Maybe they get up a little bit more there, depending on how the talent is. And, and, and again, I'm not all that worked up about, the X's and O's. To me, it's about the Jake and Joes. And we know the Patriots have a talent deficit. I mean, the 49ers, yeah, their scheme's really good. But they also have, you know, Christian McCaffrey, George Kittle, Debo Samuel, Brandon Ayuk. You know, we're talking about guys who are at the top of their position groups in the NFL. And when you do that, when you have talent like that, you're going to be a good offense. And, you you know, you marry scheme with the talent. The talent's more important. These guys are going to be professional. These guys are going to get the unit on the same page. They're going to be productive. Now it's on the Patriots to go find the players. And, and what would Miami be without Tyree Kill and Jalen Waddell? Uh, right. As good as Mike McDaniel is as a play caller. So I look at this and a lot of people say, oh, I love that hire. I hate that hire. This might sound boring. I couldn't care less. I'll keep saying it. We have no idea if these guys are going to be great or terrible. We, we don't. How many times have we read, oh, this guy's the next hot shot coach and he doesn't even get a job? How many times do we hear, oh, this coordinator is set to be a great head coach and he flames out in two or three years? How many times does a hire like Dan Campbell get panned in Detroit? And I panned it. But yet, here the lines are, contending. I killed the Nick Sirianni hire because of his press conference. And the jury could still be out on him with how this year ended. But the guy got to the Eagles to the Super Bowl. So like, and, and a lot of people, oh, who's Shane Steichen and who's Rich Gannon and who's Nick Sirianni? Oh, that's the coaching staff that took the Eagles to the Super Bowl last year. So we don't know. It's throwing darts. So I always look at this and ask the question, does the hire make sense? Do I like the idea of the hire? And I'm fine with it. I like it. I'm not in love with it. I like it. I like the idea of simplifying the offense. I like the idea of having a coaching staff that has some cohesion, knows each other, have worked together in the past. I like the idea of having experience on the offensive side of the football when, you know, Mayo has 0.0 .0 of that. So I like the idea. Is it going to work out? No freaking clue. And if anybody tells you with 100% certainty that this is going to work out or flame out, they're full of it. They don't know. They don't know. And I agree with you, Greg, the Jimmys and Joes matter more. Yeah, and, and also one thing to point out, and I think I left this out, but we've talked about it before. The staying the potential staying power of this offensive coaching staff is huge. And yeah. yep. you know, if if you're asking me like, you know, which would I prefer? Like, am I gonna take the chance with say um Clint Kubiak as offensive coordinator who could come in and be really good but could be gone in a year, or do I want you know, experienced offensive coordinators who might be a step or two below Kubiak, but Alex Van Pelt ain't getting a, co a head coaching job anytime soon. Ben McAdoo's not getting a coach, a head coaching job anytime soon. Would I take, would I take Kubiak or would I take those guys with the staying power? 
I'm taking the staying power because the and, and I know fans don't want to hear it and they want the flashy stuff and they love that they love it. But I'm telling you, you know, look at look at Josh Allen after Dayball. Look at you know look at what happens when these offensive coordinators leave. Look at Mike Vrabel in Tennessee when Lafleur and Arthur Smith left and, and what like what it does to quarterbacks, what it does to franchises, and like I have I think they have a chance. Like, like I said, these guys are going to be at least good and multiple years of good and working with the same quarterback. And hopefully they get one in this draft and they and they they knock it out of the park. The prospect of that quarterback growing with this coaching staff over multiple years. And also, this is the type of scheme where, you know, a lot of people know it and could come in and run it if, if some of these guys do leave. But the, the staying power of the coaching staff, to me, is an underrated factor. And it's huge, and and not enough people are talking about it. And I also think that we really don't know what this is going to look like offensively, every single detail. Greg, you mentioned both guys, McAdoo and Van Pelt, experience in Green Bay under Mike McCarthy. But McAdoo, when he was with the Giants, he loved spreading uh, defenses. You know, he he loved kind of getting the, the football out of the quarterback's hands quickly, moving it quickly. Was that because of his offensive line was so bad? Was that because of Eli being mostly washed and, you know, he didn't trust Eli? We don't really know. And in Cleveland the last four years, especially last year, Stefanski has really kind of leaned on heavy personnel, running the football, play action off of running the football, Uh, some motion, not a ton of motion, especially not a ton of motion at the snap. So, I mean, when you when you look at what McAdoo did in 2014 and 2015 versus what Van Pelt did with Stefanski last year, it looks different. I don't think we have an idea of what this offense will actually look like until we see it at training camp. And, and I think some of it, if not most of it, will depend on the talent that you have. Who do you have to work with? Who's your quarterback? Do you have a quarterback who's comfortable being under center? Cleveland, Van Pelt, they run a lot of quarterback stuff from under center. Or do you have a guy that's not as comfortable? So there's still a lot to figure out, is my point. Both guys have had long resumes in the NFL. Van Pelt's been a bunch of places. I don't know if we're going to see more motion like McVay and Shanahan. Or if it's going to be what we saw in Cleveland last year. Or if it's going to be a mix and match. We have no idea. West Coast offense is a pretty big umbrella now in 2024. Elliot Wolf. Is he the big dog now, Greg? Uh, it feels that way. Um, I think the process needs to play out a bit more like, um, you know, we'll have to see what happens. I mean, I, I again, I don't rule out additional hires, but um, I think I think the overarching thing is and what NFL people around the league are, are wondering is exactly how much are – the craft's going to pay. And is that part of the equation and all that? I mean, people think they're, they're not opening up the checkbook for the staff, for the front office to do different things or, you know, expanding uh, certain aspects of the franchise. And, you know, is, is Elliot Wolf going to be expensive? Probably not. Um, You know, but Elliot could get into a, you know, a power play where he says, you know, I want X, Y, and Z. Um, We'll have to see. I think that I think the crafts are just going along with everybody in their in their duties and at their pay level. And at the end of the day, they'll sort of, you know, hash that out. But um, I'm not ready to say just because it's Packers. There's a lot of Packers people coming in. I don't think that means anything. I think it's a it's, I think it's an easy thing to say. It's a lazy narrative that it's like, oh, well, Elliot Wolf is is doing everything. He's in charge. He's the big dog. He's driving the bus like. You know, Pat Stewart has an uh, you know, impact. He worked with Ben McAdoo in Carolina. Um, there are other people in the organization. They have consultants and things like that. So um, just with everything, everybody just overrates and it quickly overreacts to everything. Um, we'll have to see how this plays out. But there, there's a little doubt that it looks like Ellie Wolf right now is in charge. And he should. He has more experience than anybody in the front office I mean, outside of Patrick Stewart. Um, Macro doesn't, and I think Mac, it looks like Macro is more director of college scouting, uh, yeah. that sort of thing. And then Wolf is sort of pro personnel slash overseeing, probably 
overseeing everything and maybe Patrick Stewart becomes director of pro, of pro personnel, that sort of thing. I don't know if he'll end up being the guy, but I think he is the guy right now. I think Elliot Wolf is the guy. I think he is running the ship, driving the bus, whatever you want to call it. You can call me lazy, Greg. That's fine. Uh, he was back here in New England with Gerard Mayo during coaching interviews. Pat Stewart, Matt Groh, those guys, Cam Williams. You know, Cam Williams and, and Matt Groh were down in Mobile, Alabama during the Senior Bowl. Uh, was Pat Stewart down there in Alabama or was he back up here? Pat Stewart was down there. The only one who wasn't yes. was Ellie Wolf. So that tells me that Gerard Mayo's got the closer relationship with Wolf. And Wolf and Mayo were together picking this offensive staff and doing these interviews. So uh, that's what that would tell me. It, and I, I think you're going to lean towards the guy who Mayo trusts because Mayo's the head coach now. And as soon as you picked Mayo, before you picked the GM, which is why both Greg and I wanted the GM first, you gave Mayo some power. Inherently, you gave him power because now you have to make sure that whoever works as the guy in that front office is married to Mayo. The philosophy is similar. Their vision of the team is similar. They can work together. They trust each other. It's a solid relationship. So I think the fact that, you know, Wolf was here with Mayo and conducting these interviews and that these guys do have a past with Wolf, I, I think that says he is the guy right now. I also don't care about title. I don't care about title. I care about who's calling the shots. Everybody's hung up on, oh, are they going to name a GM? And why don't the Patriots like naming GM? I don't, I don't care if you call them the general manager. I don't care if you call him the McMuffin. I have no, I, I couldn't care less. What is important is who's calling the shots, who's leading the front office, whatever that title is. You can use chief football officer, like the, you know, like the Red Sox do chief baseball. It, that doesn't matter. What matters is who's taking the accountability and who has the responsibility of making the final call. I, I, I don't care about the title. Uh, speaking of Wolf, Greg, Jeff Howe had a story in The Athletic over the weekend, and it said that uh, the Patriots, if Wolf is the guy, they would look long and hard at drafting a tackle in the first round. Reaction. Did he say why he said that? I don't think he did. I think he just. I don't think he. I, I think he just put the look long and hard. Yeah, I don't really understand that. I mean, do, Elliot doesn't have, um, you know, much of a track record on that. I mean, I'm just trying to think back to Cleveland. I mean, yes, they they built up the offensive line, but John Dort. Look, Wolf's never been in charge of anything. And and when I covered him in Green Bay, Elliot Wolf was known as he was one of these guys who would go out. Ted Thompson didn't really mingle a lot in the league. He sort of like was just in his office or or at his apartment. And like, you know, he, he just liked to scout and sort of keep to himself. So really like Elliot Wolf and Alonzo Highsmith, along with John Dorsey, was sort of Ted Thompson's window to the NFL. These are the guys that built up contacts who knew people around the league. And these guys, and especially Elliot Wolf, would whether it was the trade deadline, training camp, the draft, he Elliot would go nuts trying to find trades and, and other scenarios, maybe free agent signings that would improve the 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 Packers. And at the end of the day, Ted wouldn't do any of that stuff. Like these guys were like beating their heads up against the wall, trying to create all this <laughs> stuff and, and help make the Packers better. And Ted at the end of the day wouldn't sign any free agents didn't trade any draft picks or at least he never like traded up and then he just draft guys and that's the way he built the, the Packers and so I mean I've known Elliot Wolf for years and I couldn't tell you what he believes about any of that stuff and it's it's February so and who knows what's going to happen who knows I think people are going to fall in love I think there are going to be definitely teams and this is from talking to people in Mobile there are going to be teams there's going to be a few teams that think they are a Marvin Harrison Jr. away at wide receiver from being put over the top. And those teams are going to look up, look to get up to Marvin Harrison. You think three would be a sweet spot. It could even be two. And I also think that there are going to be, from what we saw at the Senior Bowl, 
I didn't love Penix or Bo Nix at the Senior Bowl. Penix yeah. was a little bit better, but those guys to me are now dropping to like definitely the bottom of the first round, if not the second round. And it's the it's the three upper quarterbacks, and that's it. So when you see the divide start to open up, now all of a sudden teams are like, well, if I need a quarterback, like if I'm the Falcons or the Vikings or the Raiders or you know whoever, you know if if I want a quarterback and I think one of these guys, one of the top three is special, then I got to trade up. And so there, there's a, there's so much time pro days combine, like basically nobody knows Jack about what anybody's going to do, especially the Patriots, <laughs> especially Elliot Wolf who has no track record. And we don't even know if he's going to have final say. So I just think what somebody's going to do with the third overall pick in February, early February, even before the Super Bowl. To me, is just you know conjecture and you know way too early for this stuff. It is early, and let's not forget Alex Van Pelt and Ben McAdoo were just hired. You would imagine. I know Ian Rappaport said uh, you know last week that Van Pelt will have a significant say in the quarterback in in the evaluation at that position. So you you would hope the Patriots would also bring McAdoo in the room for the things we brought up earlier and his evaluation skill at the quarterback position. So I don't know if anybody in that building has a clear idea who they'll pick if they want to pick a quarterback. I, I don't think they know. I don't think they have a clue. Um, also, let's not forget, like words matter. Jeff's report was if Wolf is the guy, we don't know if Wolf's going to be the guy when we get to the draft. Again, right now, he certainly seems like he's the guy. That could change. And then look long and hard. I, I would hope that the scouting department and Elliot Wolf are looking long and hard at every top 10 prospect in every in wide receiver and quarterback and tackle because you need those three positions on this football team because Belichick drove, drove the offense into the ground. So looking long and hard, to me, is just evaluating and entertaining the idea of using the pick on a tackle. It's far from a guarantee. I think, Greg, especially after what you just mentioned, and I've said this on my pod, I think part of this is building a market, building a value for that third pick. If you want to move up and draft Marvin Harrison, hey, we're open for business because we don't want a wide receiver. Hey, if you want to trade up for the the final of the top three quarterbacks in this draft, we're thinking tackle. What are you willing to give us if you want to move up to number three to draft that quarterback? To me, it, it's building a market. And finally, if you do go offensive tackle, I would say trade down. That would make the most yeah. sense because yeah, I, I think I think Alt and Fashanu and Fuaga, those guys are really going to go from like seven to ten or seven to thirteen, somewhere in that area. So if you're going to draft one of those guys, it makes a lot of sense to try to build the value of the pick, trade out of that pick, move down a few slots. I don't want you to go from three to 15, but if you go, so let's say to the Falcons, you go from three to eight, you pick up extra draft capital. Now you draft Alt, Fashanu, or Fuaga, whoever you like the most. And I'm a Notre Dame fan. I'll tell you, I think Alt's an absolute freaking stud. I don't think it's a terrible idea to draft an offensive tackle that could be a pro bowler for the next 10 to 15 years. And somebody who, if, if does hit the projections and plays at that top level is, is going to get a gold jacket one day while you pick up extra draft capital. I, I don't think that's an awful plan. I'm sorry. Yeah, I agree with you. And, um, you know, it'll be interesting to see how they get the quarterback. I mean, I could definitely, Wide receiver is one of these that uh, – I'm sorry. If you can't draft wide receivers, as we've seen with the Patriots in, in recent years, if you can't find enough wide receivers in the draft, in the middle rounds, three to like five, and, you know, they got Pop Douglas in the sixth this year. Um, I'm sorry, but you're not much of a franchise. You're not going to be much of a franchise. You just have to. The way these guys come out, these guys have been playing in spread offenses since they were out of diapers. And – offenses youth football to high school football throws it like never before like if you can't find guys up and down the draft at wide receiver if you need them um then you have a problem and you're not going to be a very successful franchise and so uh to me um you know getting the tackle having a plan at quarterback and again the draft's going to come after free agency slash you know some some of the trading so the Patriots yep. could have their veteran stop 
gap got by then, including, you know, Jacoby Brissett is a guy who would make a lot of sense because um, he's sturdy, he's experienced, he's a good locker room guy, and he, and he played with for Van Pelt in Cleveland. And so he knows the scheme and he'd be a perfect guy to, you know, say mentor, whether it's you take Jaden Daniels three or maybe you take Penix or McCarthy or Bo Nix, you know, later, like Jacoby Brissett would be the perfect guy. And again, I know Felger didn't like this when I said it the other night on TV, but the Patriots are not about 2024. They're about the future. And you can't just say we're going to build the best team for 2024. For you No, know, you need to build something that lasts and you need to layer it and you need to just have an eye on the future. I'm not saying toss away 2024, but we all know they're not winning a Super Bowl next year. If they want to get back to contender status, this is going to be a multi-year thing. I don't think it's very long. Two years, you know, they should be competing and, and, and starting the upward trend, sort of like the Lions have. But – um, I'm not sacrificing anything just for 2024. We'll talk about Belichick's farewell in a minute. First, check out the guys at BSJ, 50 bucks for the year. Bedard and Giardi, of course, Corrales and others. Also, this episode is brought to you by FanDuel, exclusive wagering part of the CLNS Media Network. $200 in bonus bets if your first bet of $5 or more wins. So Belichick bid farewell to the fans in the Boston Globe. Greg, did you like what he wrote? I did. I thought it was really good. I mean, I think this was uh, in the can, uh, probably hoping to release it when he was named Falcons coach. So uh, that didn't really happen. But, um, you know, I thought it was really good. I thought it was sincere. This is a guy who's spent a bulk of his life in New England, you know, from Andover to Wesleyan to the Patriots. Um, I, I don't think that was just for for show. I think that he really wrote it. I think he was sincere and I think it was really good. I agree with you. I don't have a ton to say. I have a lot more to say about uh, Jacoby Myers, who was on with Felger and Maz yesterday and told everybody that uh, Belichick was unwilling to budge a million bucks to match the offer. Now, I'm just going to highlight the actual deal in reality because everybody runs with the first number that's released. Greg will tell you. The vast majority of the time, if not every time, that's coming from the agent. <laughs> and the reason why it's coming from the agent is because the agent wants you to believe that Jacoby Myers signed a three-year, $33 million contract, when in reality, Jacoby Myers signed a one-year deal that could make him up to $11 million. He got $10.5 million guaranteed, $500,000 for workout bonuses and other incentives. So he's not tied to 2024. He's good. Guaranteed money was the first year they can get out of that contract. Vegas can before the new league year starts in March. Juju got 16 million guaranteed. Nine of that 16 million was guaranteed last year. Seven million of the guaranteed is in 2024. So what Jacoby is saying, the way I read it is the Patriots were willing to pay Juju $9 million guaranteed instead of paying Jacoby Myers. 10, 11 million guaranteed. And that's where you get the $1 million with the bonuses and all that other stuff. And I just, looking back on it, Greg, man, what a monumental mistake by Bill Belichick. And I'm going to be transparent. I liked Juju over Jacoby Myers. I liked the idea of Juju over Jacoby Myers until we saw that Juju couldn't move. And that his knee was done. And, you know, Burt Breer came out saying everybody in the league knew. The Patriots knew. They had the medicals. They saw this guy. There was a report that came out a week or two ago saying that they were surprised by the lack of route running detail he had. They just they swung and missed on Juju Smith-Schuster massively. And, man, oh, man, an extra million dollars likely has Jacoby Myers here. And, of course, you can go down the DeAndre Hopkins rabbit hole as well. But one million bucks, it, it really shows you, um, some would say the stubbornness of Bill, some would say the pettiness of Bill, but that drove me crazy when I saw that yesterday. Yeah, I would agree with you. I mean, I think we we see this um, similar in that, um, look, I, I mean, how many years was I saying like the Patriots need to get back to being more uh, quicker, more explosive from 
the slot position. I like Jacoby Myers, and he was good and steady, but he wasn't very explosive. And in Juju, you know, in theory, he was um, better after the catch, all these th- all yep. these sort of metrics. He was better than Jacoby Myers and maybe like a, a little bit of a step up and it gives you time to find like a Pop Douglas, you know, that sort of thing. So on paper, like it made sense. But also at the time, you know, we cautioned to say like, this guy barely played in the Super Bowl. Like they didn't think he was going to play. His knee was uh, swelling up, all this stuff. Then we learned Juju didn't – I don't think he got surgery in the offseason, or maybe he did. Right? What have you, it just looked strange. And that's a tough deal where, you know, at least the thing the thing that Jacoby Myers brought, Nick, that I thought was worth the investment, and even if you wanted to bring it – remember, somebody in the Patriots front office told me that Juju wasn't the replacement for Jacoby Myers. Mike Kosicki was the replacement for Jacoby Myers. And then Juju was sort of brought uh, on top. But to me, Jacoby Myers was professional. He was tough. He, Mac Jones and him obviously had a rapport. And, uh, you know, he would help the offense get off to a better start. Instead of having all these moving pieces, new offensive coordinator and Bill O'Brien, you know, you have – Juju's in here and all this stuff and, and it, it just there was too much change and uh it was just yeah it was completely forgettable I can't believe that Belichick ended up doing that for a guy who had a who had a crappy knee we'll have more Patriots for you later this week we'll also uh talk a little bit about the Super Bowl whether or not Greg and I are excited about that what we see happening in that game just a little bit of that but until then be well be safe be good It is the Greg Bedard Patriots podcast with Nick Cattle.